request others to mute their audios please somebody some kids are ah uh, yeah like sir yeah uh, good evening friends welcome to indian arthroscopy society uh, uh, meeting today uh, it's a monthly meeting which is also named as is academy corner uh, the format of the meeting essentially is an expert talk followed by two case presentations by young uh, surgeons of the country uh, the aim is to initiate discussion on some interesting topics and some interesting case presentation and see how we can treat sports injuries better uh, the brain behind this is academic corner is our general secretary of indian arthroscopy society dr sr sundarajan i would request sr sundarajan sir to please give a brief of the meeting today uh, the name of moderators the presenters and then we take forward from there uh, our ias academic corner of this month uh, sundar all yours uh, thank you ips uh, so i will come all of you for the, our third monthly meeting of ias academic corner and outset i would like to thank dr kanchan badaria sir padacharya sir so for accepting um, to moderate this entire session uh, in spite of his uh, busy schedule on saturday evening at the same time also i thank dr jagdish from bangalore uh, for my he is a co moderated for this session and we have the star watch today. today is the one of the star watch of arthroscopy in india uh, well known dr dinsha bativala uh, who is going to uh, speak about uh, all acl injuries or the not all acl injuries are the same and not all acl uh, surgeries are the same i think it's going to be a very interesting talk and it's going to help all the young surgeons which is one of the commonly done surgeries across india at the same time i welcome dr safi and jagdish to have their case presentation today and to have the great platform today to interact with the great stalwarts like kanjan sir and tinsha in the same uh, scenario same uh, meeting and it's going to helpful uh, for all the surgeons uh, like them then i request dr kanjan bataria sir to proceed further yeah, yes thank you sundar Uh, it gives me a great pleasure to be able to moderate a session uh, with Jagdish and to have on the screen at one time three people that I can see: IPS Uberoy, Dinsho Padiwala, and Sundar Rajan. These three were about the same age and came, hit the market at about the same time. We have set the bar very high in terms of standards to be attained by orthopedic surgeons, by arthroscopic surgeons in this country. They have wide following. and all are extremely good dinsho has uh, been very popular everywhere he goes he has been operating as guest surgeons in uh, india and abroad and always to high acclaim so we look forward to what he has to say about acl injury and how he is going to do about what he is going to tell us about dinsho thank you kanchan so we've had two interesting uh, monthly meetings already both on acl and the first one was on graft choices which i think is a great topic and the second one was on btb which i think again is a great topic so i thought that let's uh, discuss individualized acl surgery because really speaking acls are not all the same and therefore maybe we should be having different sort of surgical techniques for different uh, surgical uh, for different acl tears and therefore the topic on individualized acl surgery we know that all not, not all acl injuries are the same we know that based on location of the acl injury you could have type 1s type 2s type 3s and type 4s as per the shoman uh, classification these behave differently and uh, we know that we probably should be treating these a little differently we also know that based on duration of acl injury you could have acute subacute the chronic ones which come to you after 6 weeks and the really very chronic ones where there's non visualization of the acl so based on the type of injury and where it is and the duration of acl injury i think that not all acl injuries are the same and therefore not all acl surgeries should be the same now why do i say this i say this because i use different techniques for different types of acl tears so if i have an acute 
type 1 or a type 2, which basically means a femoral ACL avulsion, then I'm going to be thinking of an ACL repair. Whereas if I've got a subacute, which means something at about the six week mark, type one or a type two, then I'm gonna think more of an ACL reconstruction with remnant preservation. Whereas if it's a type three or a four, we know that these really can't be repaired or preserved. Or in case these are chronic situations, then it would be a standard ACL reconstruction. And also partially ACL tears. Although this is not a very common entity, if you do land up with a partial ACL tear, then I think you would use a bundle specific ACL reconstruction. Again, the technique here is a little different. So let's see each of these different techniques. So the first one, if you get a patient who comes to you in the acute phase with an acute ACL femoral avulsion, a type one or a two, then this may be a candidate for a primary ACL repair. Now, this is really quite a debatable topic today because many patients like this would come to you late. And if they come to you late, I don't think it's a good indication for repair. Many of these patients may actually heal with uh, non-operative treatment. So deciding which ones to repair and which ones to treat non-operatively or which ones to treat secondarily with a remnant sparing technique, I think this is debatable. But on the whole, there are many patients who come to you today saying, look, I want to repair. And those are the guys I would offer a repair if they were type one or two. So what do I do? I identify the tear. I would then pressure it a bit with a rasp and shaver and then put in a suture anchor. Now the suture anchor needs to be put in right in the center of the AM bundle because that's really what you want to repair. And I put in a single loaded all suture anchor and I'm using this type of a device primarily so that just in case this doesn't heal or in case this patient heals and comes back with a re-tear, my reconstruction is not going to be hampered with any sort of tunnels or tapes or anything else. So simple suture anchor repair. So the anchor first goes in. I then use an instrument to take multiple bites in the stump. And you don't want to take a single bite. So you want to take a nice two to three bites, interlocking bites, so that you've got a good hold on the ACL. You want to make sure that these bites are at least to the first 25% of the length of the ACL. Because when your ACL tears, it, it retracts. And you want to make sure that when you tighten it, this retraction is gone. You may get a nice taut ACL. So once you take, you've taken your sutures in the ACL, you can see I'm pulling on the other strand. And this really tightens the ACL and pushes it into its footprint. And once that's done, I'm going to tighten my knots. And again, when you tighten the knots, you'll see that your ACL becomes nice and taut. So at the end of the procedure, you need a good quality ligament, which is traversing itself from the tibial footprint to the femoral footprint. And at the end of the procedure, you want to make sure that you don't have any impingement either in the notch or on the side wall there. So you've got your ACL then repaired back to its anatomical site. Some people prefer to put in uh, a fibrin clot to help with the healing. Uh, some people put in some PRP, the different sort of techniques used for this. I usually will repair it. And then if at most add a little bit of uh, whole blood out there or sometimes the fibrin clot, if I feel that I've not got a good uh, uh, vascular sort of uh, uh, space there. We know that blood and these blood products are helpful in healing. So that's the only reason I do it, but I'm, I don't do any BMAC or any specialized sort of uh, uh, augmented PRP there. And once I've done that, I would hope that that would heal. Now, on the other hand, if your patient comes to you in the subacute phase, so say you've treated this patient non-operatively or he comes to you secondarily at six weeks, he's got a Lachman test, which is positive, it's a type one or a two, then this patient at this phase, I don't think is good enough for repair. Repair certainly should be done in the first two weeks. So for me, a patient like this requires a remnant preservation ACL reconstruction. It's something that I call biological internal bracing with remnant preservation. So in this, I'm gonna have an ACL graft out there, but I'm also gonna preserve the remnant and probably repair the remnant. So how do I do this? I do this with three different techniques. So the first one 
if I've got a stable stump, so this is a type one with a stable ACL stump. This stable ACL stump, what would I do? I'd do a full ACL reconstruction, I'd retain that stump, but I'd pass the graft through that stump. So for this, I'm gonna take my standard femoral tunnel, but when I take my tibial tunnel, that tibial tunnel will be within the ACL stump. Now this needs to be done a little carefully so that you don't disrupt the ACL stump on the tibia. You also need to make sure that despite this being a remnant sparing technique, your tunnels are absolutely anatomic. So this is a difficult step, especially on the tibia. If you're in doubt, you may want to use a C arm to ensure that you are in that perfect spot. Now, once you've done this, your graph needs to be pulled through the, uh, through the remnant. And this is gonna make sure that your remnant now is tensioned. Now, why is this so important? This is important because the mechanoreceptors are basically within five to eight millimeters of the footprint, both on the femur and on the tibia. Now you've lost your mechanoreceptors on the femur, but at least you want to retain those in the tibia. Now, these mechanoreceptors will be, uh, you know, will be reactivated because of retensioning. So if you don't get tension back in the stump, then studies show that these mechanoreceptors are of no use. So why are you retaining this remnant? You're retaining it because it's gonna add vascularity. You're retaining it because of the biomechanical factors and you're also retaining it because of these mechanoreceptors. So you must get back that tension in that. And this is a good way of doing it where you pass the graft through the stump and you get that graft uh, within this stump and the stump acts as an envelope. On the other hand, if you've got an unstable ACL stump, so something like this, so this is again at six weeks, this patient has failed a trial of non-operative treatment, he hasn't united, you can see that he's got a femoral stump out here, and he's got this big ACL stump here on the tibia. Now, this is something that I won't want to sacrifice. So again, I'm going to identify my femoral footprint, take an anatomic ACL uh, uh, tunnel here. And once I've done this, I'm going to take my tibial footprint. Now, again, for the tibial footprint, you want to make sure that you take it in a way where you don't destroy your stump out here. So I'm going to take my jig, take my footprint, uh, take my uh, uh, reamer, and I'll start with first a 6mm, a 7mm, and finally an 8mm. So I've got my 8mm done. Now, when you've done this technique, you don't want to go through and through the tibial stump. You want to come up to the bone and then identify this. You may use a probe and just retract your stump and make sure that you haven't disrupted, especially these anterior part of the tibial footprint. Then this is an unstable stump. So if I just pass my graft through, this stump is gonna be flapping around and this is probably gonna cause either a cyclops or it's gonna cause impingement. So I need to repair this stump back. So I then take an anchor and I put an anchor. With my anchor, I'm gonna take bites in the stump. So this is something between a reconstruction and that repair that you just saw. Now, this stump goes right up to the femoral footprint so therefore I'm taking the anchor and that anchor will be taken as a curved suture anchor. You take a curved suture anchor just anterior to your femoral socket and you use a curved one so that you don't uh, uh, go into the socket itself. If you were to use a straight one, you may actually get into the socket and you might uh, lose your anchor hold. So you take a curved anchor, you've taken your sutures already there, you don't tie it as yet, you retract your stump, pull your graft into position. So you've done an ACL reconstruction. You've used an 8mm graft out there. Once your graft is in, you fixed it. It's nice and taut. Then you go ahead with your tightening of the stump. So now I've fixed my ACL. I've made sure it's nice and taut. I then put my stump into position. And with my stump into position, I would knot it down. And once I've done this, I've got exactly what I wanted. I've got my biomechanical effect coming in from the remnant. I've got my vascularity that this remnant is gonna help with. And most importantly, I've got the retention stump, which is gonna help those mechanoreceptors in the tibial area 
to help with early proprioception and probably earlier return to sport. So there are a few reports now, especially coming in from Japan and the first guys who started off with this technique to show that clinical studies also are available that show that these patients will have not just a look, good looking ACL out there, but something that's gonna help with probably earlier return to sport. And my third technique is when I've got something like this, a stump that doesn't go right up to the ACL footprint. So this is a type two, this is subacute, this is coming to you at six weeks. This stump is not gonna be fixed directly to the bone because it's not gonna go right up to the bone. So I can't use a suture anchor for this, but I'm gonna tie this stump onto the graft itself. So in this, what do I do instead of uh, 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 anchor? I'm just gonna take some bites of fiber wire, zero number through the stump, exactly the same sort of technique that we saw in the previous patient. I'm then gonna pass my graft. So that's the graft which is passed through. And this suture is going around the graft. So basically, I'm gonna make sure that my remnant out here comes and sticks on like an envelope on top of the graft. And again, this achieves all of the three objectives of remnant preservation. One is adding collagen tissue to your graft. So it's gonna make it a nice thick graft. So that's the biomechanical effect. And then gonna have the vascularity coming in from this graft. And finally, the retention stump so that the mechanoreceptors here near the uh, tibial footprint also reactivated. And therefore, this is the three different techniques that I use either going through the graft, uh, going through the remnant, or if it's an unstable ACL stump, then using either a suture anchor or a suture to stump remnant repair. And in all of these, you have to make sure that you don't have any impingement because these tend to be slightly larger. You need to make sure that you've got full extension at the end of the day. So in conclusion for my remnant preservation, I'm gonna check for my stump stability. If it's a stable stump, then I will go ahead with uh, through and through, no anchor, no suture. And this is uh, commonly referred to as the Samba technique or the selective anteromedial bundle uh, ACL reconstruction technique. And if the stump is unstable and it reaches right up to the femur, which is a type one, I'll use an anchor. But if it doesn't go right up to the femur, it's a type two, then I'll use just a suture to augment this back to the graft. So this is biological internal bracing with remnant preservation, three different techniques with the same purpose. Finally, my next. So in case it's your standard ACL tear, that means a chronic ACL tear, or if it's a type three or a type four ACL, this entire ACL is shattered. This I think requires your standard ACL reconstruction. And for this, you could use any graft. A BTB would be fine. A quadruple semi-T would be fine. Uh, you could use your graft of choice. And for this, I'm gonna get all of the stump out. I will usually try and retain something on the tibia, though nothing on the femur. I think when you're taking your femoral footprint, it's very important that you really identify the anatomic footprint. Now, when I do an anatomic footprint, I will really take the midpoint of the AM bundle. It's not gonna be the center of the ACL because we do know that if you try and take the center of the ACL itself, these patients have a very high retear rate. So really, when you're talking of a single bundle ACL reconstruction, it'll be primarily all of the AM bundle footprint. So all of the AM gets covered and some of the PL will get covered. Finally, on the tibial side, you wanna make sure that you're going as anterior as possible but again, not so much that you're out of the footprint. Finally, that's my quadruple semi-T. I've uh, fixed a button device on the fe uh, femur. I fixed it with a screw on the tibia. And here again, you can see that even though I've got most of the footprint off, I try and retain a little bit here. I know that this is truly not remnant preservation because this is not gonna add to the uh, biomechanics of the graft. It's not gonna to add to the vascularity of the graft, but I'm hoping that the mechanoreceptors here will adhere to the rest of the graft and then uh, um, you know, help in early proprioception. And finally, for the partial ACL tears, 
So when you get a situation like this, a lot of these would be treated non-operatively, but in case it's a high demand athlete, even with these partial ACL tears, they're gonna have uh, instability. So like this footballer who has been treated non-operatively initially, has failed non-operative treatment, still feels unstable at that six weeks, this would be a bundle specific ACL reconstruction. So in this, this AM bundle is intact, it's just the PL bundle which has been reconstructed. So a bundle specific sort of reconstruction, you need to be a little different from your standard one. And in a patient like this, who's got his PL bundle intact, but the AM bundle is torn. So this is the AM bundle that's torn. The PL itself is intact. You get this uh, stump off and you go ahead with uh, AM bundle specific reconstruction. So this one is almost similar to your standard ACL reconstruction, but you retain your PL part, make sure that your uh, tibial footprint is as anterior as possible so that you don't disrupt the PL. And then keeping that, that's your area of the footprint of the AM that you would address with this reconstruction. So in short, individualized ACL surgery is based on the type of ACL tear and the chronicity of the ACL tear. If you do deal with patients who do come to you early, then you have the options of an ACL repair for the type ones and twos. For the subacutes, try and retain as much uh, uh, remnant as you can. So if it's a subacute with type one and two, then you've got different techniques for remnant preservation. Your chronic ACLs, it's a standard ACL reconstruction. You could also do that for the type three and fours. And for the partial ACL tears, a bundle specific ACL reconstruction. Thank you. Thank you, Densha. Uh, very, very good uh, presentation. Uh, if you can have maybe some questions, uh, Kanchan. Yeah, sure. So, can I hear? So, yeah, yeah. Who has a question so we, first? Yeah, so I can ask a question first and then we initiate. Yes. Densha, I mean, whenever you try to preserve the stump, is there a good idea to use an outside in zig on the femoral side uh, so that you are actually not uh, damaging the stump when you are reaming? Because sometimes it is technically difficult to really protect that stump and go to the anatomical point on the femoral side because that's also very important. So, so I think whenever you're doing remnant preservation, you don't want to do that at the cost of getting non-anatomic tunnels. So that's absolutely critical. You're going to do remnant preservation, but you have to have anatomic tunnels. Now, to get anatomic tunnels, especially on the femur, you need good visualization. So again, that's absolutely critical. My problem with, so I, the, the outside in concept is fantastic. I think as, as a concept, it's fantastic. But for me, I find that when you get the reamer from out to in, yeah. You need a, a close, almost a centimeter before you can get the blade to flip. And so I find that a little bit challenging. Whereas if I do it from inside out, exactly what you mentioned, the challenge is to make sure that your tibial stump doesn't get uh, destroyed. So yeah. what do I do? I do it inside out. I'm going to use my offset jib to take my guide wire. So the guide wire is not a problem. I then use my 4.5. So my 4.5 goes in without any reaming. So you need to go right up to the footprint. And then when you are pushing, you need to quickly push it in so that it's in the bone as soon as possible. Now, when you go with your 7.5 or your eight, again, you do the same technique. Because you've used 4.5, you'll find that that round tip, you can't use a cylindrical reamer because that would destroy your tibial stump. You use your acorn or your round tip uh, reamer. Again, you give good pressure initially, and that bursts in. So usually you can protect your tibial uh, stump. If you have any doubt, you can use your fast fix introducer as a protector of your stump. So that protects your stump, and then your reamer has no chance of uh, uh, landing up with any uh, stump damage. If you're very used to the outs outside in technique, then you could use it, but I think you need to be a little careful and you are certainly there need to protect your stump because that reamer needs to come in at least a centimeter before you can flip the blade and take it uh, uh, retrograde. Perfect. And Dinsha, is your, uh, do you have any experience of using flexible reamers in such cases? 
does it actually add on uh, difficulty Not in really. the technique or is it it makes it more simpler than you, you it's more flexible and then you can work on without damage really. so I, I i do have flexible clancy reamers and i use it primarily for revision cases when i'm having difficulty and i want to try and avoid the old uh, socket but in these cases routinely all you need to do is hyperflex you can see the femoral side really well and um, i i would prefer to use just the standard reamers uh, uh, but certainly you want to use the femoral reamers and not the tibial reamer on the femur because that would yeah. destroy your yeah. thank you thank you thank you uh, dincha sundar here uh, yes sundar especially in the subacute type where you are going to preserve almost your entire acl and at the same time yeah. going to do a reconstruction did you feel ever that uh, it is going to impinge in the intraoperatively did you feel like that did you need to do notch plast any time or in the follow up did you find any patients had restriction of the movements especially in the terminal flexion okay so that again is the critical point there so i think there are two critical points with remnant preservation the first make sure that you are perfectly anatomic don't do a remnant preservation at the expense of non anatomic uh, uh, tunnels so i think that's absolutely critical number 2 is exactly this that when you're putting your graft in you you cannot have a large graft you can't have a btb for sure it's going to be a semi t your semi t needs to be 7.5 or 8 you can't have a 9 and a 10 because then you'll have too much you know acl tissue there and you will have impingement so you need to make sure that your graft is adjusted number 2 on the tibia your graft needs to be a little more posterior so you're really uh, targeting the center and the posterior aspect of the acl on the tibia because what's so important is that anterior flare you know that big fan shaped flare you can never reconstruct that that's so unique to the acl and that is what you want to preserve so you preserve that aspect and that's really like your envelope over the acl now we have had instances where and you must check for impingement so you saw all those videos i try to show that you must check for impingement at the end of the day now we have had some situations where at the end of the procedure we've had some impingement on the roof so in that case you would do a notch plasty you would increase your uh, notch out there so that you at the end of your procedure you certainly should have hyper extension because that uh, they are very very valid points because i brought this into uh, questions because i had two cases of to do a uh, no decompression because patient came with uh, uh, severe impingement with restriction of the movements so i think the size of the graft which has to be little lesser than the what we use normally and the entry point is bit should be little lower than the what we use in generally for acl reconstruction i think there are two valid points to prevent that uh, impingement thank you and then uh, dr dinsha one more and uh, when you are placing the anchor over there to take the uh, you know to retain the stumps and all if the anchor where you are going to place it you know which will be little bit anterior to the tunnel how it got to keep it a little bit of an uh, a distal to the tunnel okay so i think that again is a great question so normally what i'm going to do to make sure that my acl reconstruction is anatomic my tunnel is going to cover the entire am part of the footprint on the femur so the way i normally do it is i take the anchor a little anterior so it really comes into the pl portion you need a curved anchor because if you use the same portal it is going to go into your socket so you need a curved anchor that comes in you need to have a 2 mm bridge between the anchor so you need to make sure that this is again within the footprint of the acl but the pl part and what this does is because your graft is going to go into the am this remnant comes and sticks onto it as a envelope now why is it important to retention and the reason for retentioning is two things one if you just do a remnant preservation and you don't fix this graft this is going to be an unstable flap and this flap could easily flip over and cause a cyclops nodule which is then going to cause impingement you're going to have to come secondary and take it off so fixing it on the graft i think is important it gives it the biomechanics it will then help you know heal and adhere to the graft but most importantly what the studies seem to show is that unless you retention the stump these mechanoreceptors don't get activated 
The second part that you need to understand is that these mechanoreceptors after about the sixth or the seventh week are gone. So you can't think of doing a remnant preservation after, you know, so you've missed the bus if you try and do it at two months or three months. You could probably keep that remnant there, but it's gonna look good. It may add to vascularity, it may add to collagen, but it's not gonna to add to the proprioception. So that's why doing it at the appropriate time is also so important. And one more question. So any time, uh, have you thought about it? You no, know, well, after the repair and uh, bundle specific, you know, the protecting, uh, using the fiber tape to protect your uh, repair. I think that's also quite a valid uh, thing, though I don't use it so commonly. You could think of uh, putting in an internal brace too. But the way I look at it is, my graft itself is my internal brace. So that's why I call it biological internal bracing. And my ACL stump, my remnant is there. So I've, I've already got two things. Uh, you could add a third, but I think two is probably enough. Yeah, that's good. Uh, one question from uh, uh, Prakash from SRMC. Uh, in partial bundle ACL tear, your intra tip to judge whether the bundle viability to preserve or remove to, re, uh, to do a reconstruction. Yeah, again, I think that's, that's uh, you know, it's a, difficult, it's a difficult question. So true that you might see some sort of ACL out there. Is that ACL of any use? And this is really, really very debatable. So there are surgeons who feel that remnant preservation is of no real use. You're probably going to land up with a problem by taking non-anatomic tunnels in your effort to keep that. So go ahead and take off everything from the femur, everything from the tibia, get your bare footprints, and then reconstruct. And on the other side, you've got other surgeons who tell you all of these remnants are useful. So I think you need to try and assess this introp and see, is this truly a partial ACL, like the two cases that you saw at the end, where you can make out that those bundles are completely, you know, perfectly anatomic. You also get a fairly good idea on the pre-op MRI. On the MRI, you're going to you know, see a patient where you can see that that AM bundle is totally intact. I think you also get a fair idea on your clinical testing. So remember, your AM bundle is important for your Lachman, whereas your PL is important for your pivot shift. So if I get a patient who's got a, a, a pivot shift positive and he's got a Lachman which is negative and the patient is complaining of instability, then I'm thinking of a PL bundle tear with the AM being intact. Now, these are not very common situations but sometimes you will see these. And then in those patients, you're going to think, okay, maybe I'm going to retain my AM and uh, you know, go ahead with just a PL. But in doing that, you have to be sure that that AM is good enough. If you have any doubt, I would suggest just get it out and do a proper uh, ACL reconstruction. Because when you're doing a PL bundle specific reconstruction, your graft is going to be just a 6.5 or 7, typically just a doubled uh, semi-T. So you don't want to land up with a situation where you've done a double semi T and what you thought was the AM is just some fibrous tissue and then you get a failure with that. That's a very valid uh, point. Uh, sir, Amakant here. Uh, sir? Yes? Uh, excellent presentation, sir. I Actually, I saw that ACL repair, you had used uh, suture anchor. Uh, is there any difference in using uh, knotless suture anchor? Because in the just suture anchor, I saw you're pulling the other side of the thread, so it got tightened and it got reduced. So do you, uh, there's any difference using knotless or uh, just suture anchor? I'm quite used to the, uh, you know, the standard suture anchors because with the standard suture anchors, you can play around with the tension that you want. With the, uh, you know, if you're experienced with knotless, you could use the knotless too. But I think it's a difficult thing to achieve your correct tension and then try and get it in. So for me, a simple suture anchor where I can retension once I've taken the bites, I can adjust that tension. For me, that's the easier way. But if you're, I'm sure the surgeons who use knotless will do it just as well with knotless too. Kancha, I have a question for you. Yeah, Kanchan. Over the years, the best of surgeons have found that the femoral attachment is to be a moving target. So what's 
you said you aim for the uh, center of the AM bundle today. So when you do it, and you, you have noticed that you use a femoral aimer. So we understand that you do it distal to the vertical ridge, inferior to the horizontal ridge. And what are the points? I'm sure each one of us do it a little differently, but what is yours? Okay, so when I say anatomic, I want to be within the footprint on the fem femoral side for sure. So that's number one. I want to cover my entire AM part for sure. Based on the graft size, I may get a little bit of coverage of the PL2. But my center point, when I take my guide wire, the, would be the center point of the AM itself. So if you actually see the full footprint, it's probably going to be two thirds, one thirds, because we know that the AM is the larger bundle, the PL is the smaller bundle. What was happening for some period of time in between when people uh, said single bundle anatomic, they were taking it at the 50% mark, right at the center of the footprint. Now, when you're doing that, you'll cover a lot of the PL, but a deficient part of the AM. And I think that that's a mistake and that's caused uh, a higher retail rate. So that's retail. why people have gone back now to uh, AM specific sort of uh, reconstruction. And I think that that's something that was being done in the past too, yeah. with lesser retail rates. So I, I think for me, anatomic means certainly full of AM with a little bit of the PL. Pretty close to where you started in the beginning. True, true. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to ask you is, uh, uh, what you just mentioned is pretty much for all of us, that when you have a chronic tear, you know, we all like to preserve whatever we can. And BTB has one disadvantage, you have to clean everything up. You can't preserve anything you want to do a BTB. So you're a strong, big footballer, you want to do it. It's only in chronic that you do a BTB. Is that right? Absolutely, absolutely. So I think the BTB is a great graft, but it's impossible to do remnant preservation with a BTB because when that graft comes in, it's going to destroy all your remnants. So. I, I, I reserve my BTBs for my chronic cases uh, and chronic means after six weeks. So uh, I, I would normally not do it for the very chronic cases because the very chronic cases will already have some patellofemoral degeneration. So I think then your BTB would be contraindicated in those patients. So for the standard sort of uh, patients where I'm not doing a remnant preservation, I think uh, BTP is a great graph. Right. Do you. we have any other questions? Yeah, sir, one question, sir. Yes, Terrence. Yeah, uh, sir, excellent presentation, by the way. Uh, sir, have you ever felt that uh, you need to use uh, two suture anchors for the repair? Like sometimes maybe one is not adequate. You, you have to use two anchors at the femoral side for repair. And in, in that case, where would you place it so that in case you're going for a revision, you, need, you won't have any issues? So I would suggest that whenever you're doing a repair with anchors, you use an all suture anchor or you use some sort of a, you know, plastic anchor or a peak anchor, so that in case you have to do a revision, you don't have to bother about it at all. If you use a metallic anchor, it may come in the way and it may come in the way of your reamers. Now, I've, I've always used one anchor, but in one situation, after putting in the first anchor and doing my repair, I felt that a portion of the ACL was still not sticking back onto the femur. So in that case, I put in a second anchor and that second anchor was a little more anterior, more towards the PL and took two or three more bites. So that was a retrospective thing because I thought that my footprint was not well covered. Uh, but on the whole, I usually would like to use just one anchor. Okay, thank you. Right, I think that's been wonderful and we should get long. Yes. And can I ask Jagdish to invite our next speaker on? Thank yes, you. I would. Yes, I would invite uh, next speaker. Doctor Syed Suranavar. Shafiq. Dr. Shafiq. Dr. Shafiq. Dr. Shafiq. Dr. Shafiq. Dr. Shafiq. Dr. Shafiq. Yes, sir. Dr. Shafiq will be doing his presentation, a case presentation on the repair of the MPFL avulsion at Patella with not less anchors. Dr. Shafiq, to take uh, 
good evening sir thank you uh, thank you is for uh, giving me the opportunity to present a case of uh, mpf revulsion uh, at the petla which was repaired with nautilus anchor sir uh, our case was a 27 year old uh, female which presented with pain in left knee following twisting injury to the knee after uh, two weeks he had immediate swelling of the knee uh, there was a uh, sorry Sorry, sir. Uh, then my presentation got lost. No worries. Okay. No issues. You're sharing your screen, Shafiq? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, is my uh, screen audible, uh, visible? No, no, not yet. No. We are not able to see. If it is taking time, yes. I think we can take the second presentation. And can we come yes. back? Yes, yes I think. Is, is it good? Yeah. Is it good for you? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Sir. yeah. So in that case, I will call. So second presentation is by Dr. Jagdish Shuranavar. He'll be presenting on anatomical ESL reconstruction yeah, think, with medial meniscus posterior road repair. Yeah. Yeah. I met Dr. Jagdish Shuranavar. Dr. Jagdish, you remember? Yeah. Can you can you hear me, sir, and see my slide? Yes. 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 Myself, uh, Dr. Jagdish, you remember? I am working in Belgium, in Karnataka, sir. I am presenting a case on arthroscopic anatomical ACL reconstruction and medial meniscus posterior root repair. Uh, a 23 year male, a military person, he had a twisting injury while playing and he came with, uh, he came to me with a giving away sensation and pain while walking. On examination, I found a uh, Latchman test was positive, anterior grade Anterior dryer was grade 2, posterior medial joint line tenderness was there, MacMurray test was positive for medial meniscus and range of movement was 0 to 135 and it was painful on further flexion. And his MRI was initially, it was showing the ACL tear and medial meniscus root tear. And my plan was to take him to OT and do a ACL reconstruction and uh, medial meniscus root repair and uh, arthroscopy was done initially i found the medial meniscus root tear was there and uh, it was probed and it is found to be lapridae type 2 tear was there it is uh, within one centimeter of the tear and with the pcl jig 50 degree angle from intermedially i drilled a 2.4 mm guide wire at the footprint after preparing with a curate and uh, later over drilled with 4.5 mm uh, drill bit. After drilling uh, for, with 4.5 mm drill bit and later I passed with bead pin, bead pin with the fiber wire and it was retrieved in the anteromedial portal, viewing from the interlateral portal. Then with the uh, Suture passer, Smith and Nephew first pass mini. I took a bite, simple stitch with a fiber wire in the posterior root and I retrieved again in the anteromedial portal 
and again similarly one more simple stitch with uh, fiber wire taken 3 mm away from the uh, first stitch and i pass i retrieved those uh, sutures in the tunnel in the tunnel from the anterior medially and i pulled it and i didn't tie uh, now after acl i tied or the anterior medial later uh, tunnel was made in the tibia and femoral tunnel anatomical tunnel posterior and medially made and 8 mm uh, thickness graft was inserted and superiorly fixed with endo button inferiorly with the uh, interferon screw and later posterior medial uh, this uh, root repair was tied in 30 degree of knee flexion and uh, at similarly i saw for graft impingement there was no impingement the roof impingement was not there and side wall impingement was not there and uh, uh, review uh, literature review showed uh, laprade has classified meniscus tears into five types sir type 1 is a partial tear and it is stable type 2 is a radial tear and again it is classified a b c uh, 0 to 3 mm 3 to 6 mm more than 6 to 9 mm and uh, type 3 was bucket handle tear with root tear type 4 is oblique tear at the root type 5 is avulsion fracture root avulsion fracture and uh, three main signs in mri of the root tear are you will see a signal perpendicular to the meniscus and one truncation sign that is a vertical sign defect i will show in a next image and the ghost sign here you see a ghost sign you absence of the absence in the sagittal section and in axial section you see a tear and in a, coronal section you see a tear in the posterior limb and here this is also important you should ask for radiologist if extrusion is more than 3 mm uh, if meniscus extrusion more than 3 mm it is of important significance that a degeneration cartilage damage is more and root tears are is there and it is associated with oa changes if it is more than 3 mm extrusion and uh, they have studied uh, meta analysis chang has uh, studied in uh, meniscus root repair and arthritis he found that in if you do meniscectomy in uh, root tear 34% uh, needed a knee replacement and if you do a root repair there were zero patients need a tkr and uh, he concluded that 80% of the patient with root repair could avoid uh, degenerative changes and uh, in systemic review study fuse et al he showed that 84 patient there was no progression of osteoarthritis if you do a meniscus repair means uh, root repair has to be done if it is found and there are uh, they in literature they have described uh, two techniques one is suture anchor technique of repairing the meniscus root repair another a trans tibial technique a single tunnel and two tunnel but uh, recent literature all support that two tunnel is better a senior author preferred technical two tunnel trans tibial repair technique because if you uh, two tunnels means from marrow growth factors will release progenitor cells will come out and it will create a broad uh, footprint for the repair also and uh, they have studied partial meniscectomy versus meniscus root repair a retrospective study by cringe et al he showed that 54% of partial meniscectomy group they progressed to knee replacement in the 5 years compared to a meniscus root repair patients and in kim et al uh, he studied 20 8 he did 28 patient partial meniscectomy and 30 patients pull out technique of root repair 46 months follow up he concluded that better clinical and radiological results in a 
meniscus root repair so all the literature suggest uh, do a root repair uh, post operative protocol i followed is six week non weight bearing cap and progressive passive range of movement was started from the safe zone safe zone is 0 to 90 degree of uh, flexion in the inish from the first day only slowly started because if you flex more than 90 degree there will be a bungy effect they call and it will re- tear rate is more and usually till 4 months deep leg presses and squatting with greater than 70 degree knee flexion should be avoided to prevent uh, re tear so take home message of this is along with acl tear if you find any medial meniscus root tear lateral meniscus root tear very rare cases these are found it is better to repair because it will give additional stability to the knee and prevent the degenerative changes and how to repair if acl tear is there medial meniscus root tear lateral meniscus root tear the principle is start repairing from the most posterior structure most posterior structure is medial meniscus posterior horn you have to suture it first next lateral meniscus posterior horn then in Uh, then acl acl is attached tibial side anteriorly this is the principle they followed and root rep- indication for root repair root repair is indicated in outer bridge type 1 and type 2 and L- loren and kelegre grade 0 1 2 with early osteoarthritis if you find a meniscus root repair it decrease it uh, that contact pressure is reduced and one more literature allegren et al he showed that if any patient with a meniscus root tear posterior or medial meniscus root tear it is equivalent to total meniscectomy because the hoop pressure will not act directly tibio femoral pressure increases and they go for osteoarthritis so uh, take home message uh, do a repair if it is root tear along with acl and uh, acl tear thank you yes yeah thank you uh, dr jagdish uranavar it was a nice presentation can you unshare any question sir any question sir dr kanchan kanchan sir yeah no i think any I'm questions sir can we ask the panel if we have any questions yes sir so can i chirag yes yeah yeah chirag jagdish ha sir yeah so so do you have any tips for uh, i mean do you think all inside root repair is better when you have a uh, 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 simultaneous acl all inside root repair yeah like with the suture anchor sir um, in uh, in literature they said trans tbl is better uh, but all inside uh, suture anchor also you can do uh, repair but uh, i, I think you have of... already done tibial tunnel sorry sir especially when you are having already having a tibial tunnel or do you have any trick how you uh, prevent the tunnels colliding sir tunnels colliding i use acl jig 55 degree for a tibia tunnel and for actually uh, smith and nephew custom made uh, uh, posterior root repair jigs are there they are little bit uh, Uh, they will miss the medial tibial condyle but i didn't have that i used a pcl jig i kept it uh, 50 degree 5 degree away and uh, this tunnel comes from posterior to it definitely they won't collide sir actually yeah, so you keep a differential angle for differential bridge. angle i kept sir and yes. what is the bridge of bone you keep between the both bridge of bone minimum more than 5 mm they say sir Okay. Chirag, is your question uh, the coinciding of two tunnels for the root repair, or are you talking about coinciding of the ACL tunnel with the root tunnel? The ACL tunnel will not get no, in no. trouble with the root tunnel. But if you have two tunnels, if you are using a two tunnel technique yes. for a root repair, I think that was the question uh, Jagdish uh, Chirag was asking. Sir, in this case, I did single tunnel, but uh, literature says two tunnel is uh, better. Uh, and in that context, uh, Chirag, if you have two, if you are doing two tunnels, and if they yeah. meet at the uh, tibial articular surface, it still does not matter. 
because what you really need is a bridge of bone when you when you tie them and in a way if uh, if you have that it gives a bigger raw area for the root to get attached to i'm talking the two tunnel uh, technique for the root repair okay. but uh, yeah Yeah, yeah, yeah. The root tunnel, I mean, root chair tunnels are, I mean, they don't collide. It should be yeah, they collide. different trajectory all together, all together. So you don't need to worry about it. The ACL trajectory and the root repair tunnel trajectory. Yes, yes. Any other questions? So usually very commonly, uh, the root tear is the lateral meniscus tear, uh, Jagdish or another. So how, so what is the mode of injury for this? Because it looks like a degenerative tear. Rather than the the forceful tear of about it, an the acute one. Had a, it is uh, he came to me after uh, one year of ACL uh, tour. He is in military and uh, initially I think he has uh, only ACL tear. I think later he told I yeah. has only in knee instability. Later again I had an injury two times injury. Later he started noticing uh, pain in the posterior medial aspect of that uh, joint line. Yes, Dinsha. Yeah, I think that was exactly the question that I was going to ask. That usually acute ACL tears associated with lateral root tears, lateral meniscus root tears. So when you get a medial meniscus root tear with an ACL, typically it's a chronic ACL, and these patients have been asymptomatic because that root has been performing the posterior horn has been the secondary stabilizer for the ACL, and then when they get their root tear. they become extremely unstable and that's why they come to you with instability but the root and the acl haven't happened at the same stage it's the acl which is chronic and the medial meniscus root which has probably happened recently and that's very true if you do just the acl reconstruction and you miss the medial root there this patient will likely fail because you've not stabilized the secondary stabilizer so it's really critical that you if you're going to be treating him which you should you also do the root at the same stage as a rate is 80% of the root tears are lateral meniscus tears only 19 to 20% medial meniscus root tears and if root tear is associated with acl and he will have a pivot grade 3 and it will further instability it is there sir okay excellent presentation uh, jagdish and uh, wonderful discussion uh, can we move on to the next uh, topic Perfect. Shafiq, are you ready with your presentation now? Yes, sir. I am ready, sir. I am sharing the screen, my. Sandeep, can you help him by calling? Okay, sir. I will. Uh, thank you. I uh, thank. Uh, sorry, sir, for the uh, mistake. Uh, thank you, IS, for giving me the opportunity to present a case of uh, acute MPFL avulsion at the patella, which was repaired with the not not less thing, sir. Uh, sir, uh, our case was a twenty-seven uh, year old female who presented with a pain in the left knee following twisting injury to the knee. uh after uh, two to three weeks after injury he had immediate swelling of the knee uh he complains of something going out of the uh, and then spontaneously reducing he had no uh, period of uh, sort of uh, this kind of injury on examination uh, the limb was in side flexion there was a tenderness which was palpable uh, present on the medial uh, patellar border there was also a defect on the middle side of the patella the uh, platelet patella guide was increased as compared to the opposite side uh, appreciation test was positive uh, sir uh, on, then we order the re uh, radiograph uh, of the knee uh, we show irregularity of the medial margin of the patella with small osteochondral fragment uh, present on the middle side of patella uh, the patella was uh, centrally placed on the uh, ap view on lateral view uh, 
there is a uh, the patellar height is normal and there is uh, no signs of any trochlear dysplasia uh, answer ap uh, view uh, there is some irregularity on uh, lateral femoral condyle uh, on mri of the uh, new uh, knee uh, on axial view uh, there seems a uh, tear at the medial margin of the patella with effusion uh, the mpfl attachment of the uh, at the femoral attachment uh, seems okay uh, the patella was uh, lately uh, translated uh, and there is a bone bruise present on the uh, lateral femoral condyle so after uh, studying the uh, clinic after clinical history examination and the radiograph uh, radiograph of the patient we decided to proceed uh, with the uh, of, uh, repair of the mpfl first we did the uh, diagnostic uh, arthroscopy of the uh, knee uh two standard uh, photos uh on uh, on arthroscopy uh, there was uh, no uh, uh, condyle fragment seen uh, or loose body seen in the uh, knee joint there was no cart uh, cartilage damage on the patella or the femoral condyle uh so there was no uh, meniscal or cartilage uh, crucial injury uh, ligament injury seen on the uh, seen but there was a defect on the medial side of the uh, patella Uh, tear was seen at the medial margin. Uh, the margins of the bone were seen uh, fresh, and tissue uh, which was uh, torn was healthy. Uh, after that, next the op open procedure was uh, planned to uh, repair the uh, MPFL and parapetal uh, ligament complex back to the patella. Uh, sir, uh, the medial uh, parapetal incision was given from superior to inferior pole of the patella. after uh, the section of deep pleural fascia tear site was identified uh, and clean uh, of any loose debris and uh, the margins of the patellar bone were fashioned after that Lost the connection again, I think. Shafi. Pandit, do you have his backup or anything like that that you can play from your side? Ah, uh, no, 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 sir, no backup. Okay. Ah, uh, he's. Yeah, he's connecting again. Uh, slot 
uh, the knee was kept in uh, 20 uh, degree of flexion the proximal uh, sutures was then uh, slotted into the uh, uh, slotted into the uh, superior uh, uh, superior hole and then the inferior uh, sutures was slotted into the inferior hole the uh, the deep crural fascia or medial reticulum then uh, was closed over the defect after uh, repair of the uh, retina column uh, the diagnostic arthroscopy was again uh, performed and the adequacy of the uh, repair was checked and cracking uh, of the patella was uh, checked which was found to be okay so sir uh, the review of this picture mpfl is an important static stabilizer of the patella it is important in uh, first 20 to 30 degree of knee flexion it prevents later subluxation of patella uh, non contact uh, injury is the most common type of uh, uh, injury uh, in i think there is some problem with this uh, connection but i think the initial presentation is over we're just going to talk about the uh, yes the future reviews so if there are any questions i can go ahead shafi can you hear us though yes uh, shafi can you hear us he is complete safi Safi, can you hear us? Can you unmute? Sir, uh, uh, yes, sir. I can, can hear. Can you take up questions? If you can hear you, if you, if he can yes, hear. Yes, sir. Sure. Okay. Right. Yes, sir. Sure, sir. So, uh, uh, Shafi, let me initiate the discussion. Uh, how do you yes, feel sir. that MPFL avulsion is different from a routine MPFL tear? what does literature uh, say sir, about uh, it sir uh, literature say, uh, literature has classified the mpfl avulsion uh, into two types first there are patellar avulsion and then there are femoral avulsion in literature uh, the patellar avulsion has been further defined into the three types and in this uh, three types of avulsion uh, in first type there is uh, tear without any osteochondral fragment and in second type there is osteochondral fragment We, along with mpfl tear and in third type there is osteochondral fragment which is extending up to the margin uh, medial margin of the uh, articular cartilage so in li literature says that if there is tear of the mpfl at the margin uh, uh, patellar margin without osteochondral fragment then we can do a uh, primary repair what if there is osteochondral fragment with uh, along with tear then we have to repair the mpfl because uh, later chances of uh, recurrent instability are more in this uh, Uh, types of patient. Okay, so, Doctor Shafiq, you have not augmented; you have only repaired. Uh, sir, we have repaired, but we augmented it with the uh, fascia, uh, medial retina column, over this. Okay, and how how old was the injury? Sir, uh, injury was a two week mm -hmm. old. Two week. So okay. subacute repair. Subacute. i think even in first time dislocator if you have an avulsion of mpfl especially with a chip of bone i think uh, there are i think literature says that the result of repairing it as better than just leaving it like that even if it is a first time dislocator uh, with a bony uh, is there so then sure do you want to add on something in such what is your experience on a mpfl bony avulsions uh, on the patellar side uh i suspect that when these uh, bony avulsions take place there's a plastic deformation of the mpfl itself and then the bone gets avulsed so i think doing an anatomic just repair of the bone uh, may leave that patient slightly unstable so i would agree that yes if you get a bony avulsion of the mpfl on the patella you must fix it But I would also probably try and tighten or retension that NPF a little bit. It's eyeballing; you can't be too sure of exactly what is 
the you know the ex, uh, the, uh, the exact amount of tightening but i think when you take the sutures you don't want to fix it just bone to bone i think you want to also probably tighten that medial retinaculum and the mpf a little bit more to ensure that that patient is uh, stable ultimately absolutely i think uh, the uh, i think the augmentation with the medial retinaculum is probably also important in such cases we do actually reinforce the and also maybe yeah but that's eye bowling you write about that i think that makes absolute <laughs> sense if you're going to operate i think mm -hmm. uh, it's best you do go the whole 9 yards rather than just fix it and come back absolutely so any more questions in the chat box uh, jigdish my question would be that in case you found that this was a chronic patient so this patient had had three dislocations you know so the patient is a female she's had three patellar dislocations and you find that that's a chronic chip of bone in that situation shafiq what would you like to do would you like to just freshen the bone and fix it back or would you do an mpfl reconstruction would your management change from a standard patellar instability yes shafiq the question is to you shafiq sorry sir my uh, can you please, uh, please repeat the question my connection has got down okay so what i was saying is you yes, got sir. this mpfl bony avulsion from the patella as a first yes, time dislocation and you repaired it and that was absolutely perfect but assume that this patient had three or four dislocations a history of three or four patellar dislocations yes, and sir. on the x ray you saw that there was this chip of bone there on the medial part of the patella so basically this is yes, now a recurrent yeah. patellar dislocation and if you saw a patient with a recurrent patellar dislocation and a chronic bony avulsion would your treatment differ or or would you do exactly the same thing no sir my treatment would definitely be different because if the patient has a uh, three four time dislocator then maybe he has some other problems as well uh, so in these cases i will uh, first check the uh, alignment is whether he has any uh limb mal alignment so assuming all of that is normal uh, yeah assuming everything else is fine limb alignment is fine uh, no trochlear dysplasia uh, no patella alta everything else is fine it's basically an mpfl deficiency with a uh, you know chronic uh, patella revulsion of that piece so in that case sir i would definitely go for reconstruction because in uh, in chronic cases uh, uh, they uh, uh, mpfl would have been not that much of quality and the uh, future chances of redislocation would be more in repair cases uh, than in reconstruction cases so definitely sir in p4 time uh, recurrent dislocation i would do uh, reconstruction of the mpfl rather than repair and that piece of bone you'd excise or you just leave it alone sir uh, i would uh, excise uh, because it may uh, in future may uh, become a loose body or if uh, so i would excise that piece i think i probably do the same yeah, yeah. okay so my question is to dr dinsha sir sir yes sir yeah. so first time dislocator i think if it is chronic would you always go ahead and repair or would you have a role for a conservative treatment Uh, sorry chirag i missed that so first time dislocator yes would you, would you have a role of a conservative treatment or would you always go ahead and repair uh first time patellar dislocator a standard yeah. first time patellar dis i would almost mm -hmm. always treat these patients non operatively so uh, most of my first time uh, my connection is there right yeah it yes, is yes yeah. yes okay yeah. so yeah, yeah. my approach for first time patellar dislocators is almost always non operative unless there's certain specific indication so if there's an osteochondral fracture to the patella or an osteochondral fracture to the lateral femoral condyle i think that becomes an indication for primary fixation of that fragment and when there's primary fixation of that fragment then i would do a primary repair of that mpfl but otherwise i treat these patients non operatively we know that not everyone is going to have recurrent episodes 
And my only indication would be sometimes a high level athlete. So sometimes when you've got a high level athlete, he's uh, had it at the end of the season and he says, look, you know, this is probably going to be a better time for me to address it than to do it subsequently. And we know that 70% of these situations land up with recurrence. So in those cases, I may opt. But otherwise, usually I treat a first-time patellar dislocator non-operatively. Uh, sir, Sandeep here, sir. Uh, sir, so when do you do MRI for these first-time dislocators? What is the indication? Almost always. I actually almost always do it. Because sometimes when you mm -hmm. land up with these chondral fractures and osteochondral fractures, you may not pick it up on an X-ray. So for a patella first-time dislocator, I almost always will do uh, MRI. Uh, this is something where uh, you know we've had too many patients come to us late uh, with fragments that we could have fixed, which were not identified and which we really have to remove. So I think I would almost always, with a first-time dislocator, just get it done. And, and it's not so much for the MPF, but it's for the osteochondral fracture. And on, the, on this note, I'll add that when I, I send them for an MRI every time, and I write down to the radiologist to look for a uh, loose body, because this is something frequently missed by the radiologists. True. Uh, Shafiq, is there any literature which also talks about size of the defect in this uh, emergence that the, if the defect is small, you may as well leave it. If the defect is larger, uh, you may actually go ahead and uh, repair it primarily. Mm -hmm. No, sir. As such, there is no literature that exactly which tells that we, uh, this MMR, this uh, size, uh, we should uh, do uh, conservative or operative. They just say that the, uh, the fragment, uh, which is type uh, P1 according to uh, Silnapa classification, they should be uh, repaired. Or maybe a large uh, fragment which is extending to the medial margin of the articular cartilage, that should be repaired primarily. So your case fits in type B? Yes, sir. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So, uh, Sundar, no more questions, yeah. so we can just do maybe concluding yeah, remarks. Can conclude, sir. Uh, Kanjan, sir, you can conclude the meeting. Right. I thank all the speakers, Dinshaw, Shafiq, and Prakash for this wonderful presentation and a very lively question answer session. And just like every month, I think. This is something that we look forward to, and I'm sure it's getting better and better. I uh, thank uh, Sundar Rajan and IPS for asking me to be a part of this meeting, and I congratulate each one of you for this wonderful uh, presentation. Good night. Thank you, sir. Good night, everyone.